recent brief adjournment, I took occasion to confirm uh, that the audio statement which we all heard in this hearing is, is a statement which relates to the live streaming which has been conducted via a separate channel somewhere else and it's something that we can disregard. Thank you, Your Honour. So I'll continue my brief closing uh, point. So Your Honour would quash, Your Honour would not remit. Your Honour ought to, it may not be strictly necessary, but we, we say Your Honour ought to make an order requiring the release of the applicant from immigration detention. It may not be strictly necessary because that would be legally obligatory on the officers to release him anyway, because as soon as the cancellation decision has been quashed, the visa jumps up like a jack-in-the-box and there'd be no basis on which he could be detained. But the federal court in recent uh, history has considered it appropriate. I, I've read the decision. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, Your Honour, two points. First of all, we uh, maintain our um, submission that it's open to Your Honour to grant. Your, Your Honour, obviously, as a Chapter 3 uh, court, must give reasons for your decision. Your Honour does not need to give reasons for decision at the same time. That's clearly so. And there are ample cases, and we've cited some, where uh, considerations of urgency of various kinds have uh, uh, caused courts to give orders before reasons. If Your Honour, uh, I am submitting, uh, is not uh, in a position to give uh, reasons at a time uh, which would enable my client practically to compete at the tournament, were he to be successful, we would, in that circumstance, all urge Your Honour to make an order and for reasons to come later. Finally, uh, Your Honour, with respect to the interlocutory injunction, it may be to some extent overtaken by events in that last night, Your Honour, ordered that um, uh, the Commonwealth ensure that Mr Djokovic be present with us uh, while this hearing continues, and I think Your Honour has now indicated until judgment. To the extent necessary, I would rely on all of the submissions I've made today and all of the submissions that we've now made in writing in support of the proposition that uh, Mr Djokovic plainly has a strong prima facie case for relief the balance of convenience heavily weighs in favour of the grant of an interlocutory injunction. Mr Wood, can I just say this? Um, M M Mr Tran has made submissions representing a model litigant and at least on Thursday was clear that at that point, subject to further qualifications, which he was equally clear to make then about the future, that uh, deportation was off the... Uh, table at that point. I'm not suggesting that position of pains in an unqualified way into the future. What, what I am suggesting is um, rather this, if you'd bear with me. If one accepts the submission respecting the delivery of a judgment which could be the subject of an appeal as distinct from the provision of reasons for the judgment and orders, then the type of interlocutory relief to which yourself and Mr Tran may wish to turn your attention may be time limited, as it were, for a period of 48 hours after the expiry of any available time for a, a, the lodging of an appeal. Uh, I haven't reflected fully on this and it's one of the reasons I wanted to ask you and those assisting to exchange with Mr Tran a draft minute which precisely mirrors what you consider to be given by way of judgment at a final hearing. Um, I, I won't say anything more about that aspect of the matter and the nature of the injunction that should be given on a final hearing. But uh, the only other issue, um, well, look, just I'll, while, while it's in my head, it, it, it would be the usual practice and uh, you'd both be content, I imagine, for any issue of cost to be dealt with on the papers in the usual way. You can make short submissions, not do that in chambers. The other thing that I think far more important uh, on the evidence of Mr Djokovic, uh, which seems to reflect the fact 
um, working backwards, he provides a range of documents to the delegate, which I think in all material respects are copied. So there may be no problem there. The problem, which is uh, a more immediate one, is the uncontradicted evidence that he has given his passport and does not have it. So uh, I, I am concerned to decide this matter on a final basis, and I will be less than grateful if someone after the event says, oh, there are other things we are now thinking about. Is that clear? Yes, Your Honour. We have prepared a draft minute of proposed order, but we'll reflect on what Your Honour's just put to yeah, I, I, that, I, That's exactly why I raised it, because, you know, uh, if, let's be honest, if we all stand back from these things with, with, with the degree of cooperation that is being shown in this case, uh, if all parties uh, make a valuable contribution to what they represent or submit represents a, an appropriate form of complete final order, albeit that you might disagree with one another, but you'll put together a composite document that embodies everything and provide it in word format, then that's what I'm asking you to do. Now, Mr Tran, um, it, it being nearly 1.30, I propose not to adjourn, to adjourn at least not before uh, 2.30, but having said those things, two matters, uh, my present understanding is that you are content to proceed today uh, subject to instructions, which is a matter that you can inform me about now or later if you want. But I'm not going to bring the matter back until you've had at least an hour, unless you want some further time beyond that, say three o'clock. The other matter which uh, perhaps uh, your junior, Ms Wooden, can assist the court with via email to myself and uh, counsel on the other side. If you have in uh, contemplation taking the court to a series of documents in the evidence or a series of authorities. I'm not going to tie you down to how you want to frame your submissions, but if you would be assisted by me being informed in advance of things you would like to commence addressing, then I'd be very happy to know that if that's something you want to do and you don't have to do it. Your Honour, can I propose this course? And of course, Your Honour will hear for Mr Wood and Mr Holdenson, whether they have any submissions about this. What I would suggest, uh, if Your Honour is minded to allow me to do it, is if I could speak for perhaps up to 30 minutes to get us to 2 p.m. The purpose of that is, I think, to make um, some comments about where I'm actually going and to highlight in my respectful submission what are some of the key issues for Your Honour. Of the course. Of that, I will attempt to make some submissions about what some things might be non-issues, and I'll also highlight a few authorities. And then if you could take the adjournment at two o'clock, I think the utility of taking that half hour will help frame for your That's a very helpful period. suggestion. And I see Mr. Uh, Holdenson and Mr. Wood uh, assenting to that suggestion. I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Roger. I'm going to start using this short 30 minutes by addressing paragraphs three and four of the reply submissions and yes. then charting for your honour how it is I propose to deal with ground three, and then after the adjournment, I'll actually do that, deal with ground three. If Your Honour brings up the reply submissions from very early this morning. And yes, goes I have those. Three, and Your Honour will read there, and this is um, my gloss of it, but of course Your Honour can read it. It says there, my gloss, that the applicant was pressured during that transcript that Your Honour has read. Can I be crystal clear that Your Honour can rely on that submission and that evidence to find as a fact that the applicant felt pressured? Of course, I haven't sought to cross-examine the applicant. But can I make it crystal clear that what Your Honour, Honour can't do is find that any officer intended to pressure him? And Your Honour will appreciate the difference there. And Your Honour, I do. But... Look, look um, I will tell you immediately if, if... You understand that I have a, a very great desire to engage with counsel in a fairly Socratic way so that you can remind me squarely when you say you, your honour is going down the wrong path, you need to listen and this is something you might be assisted by now. 
uh, the point you make, the distinction between any positive uh, affirmative desire to impose pressure is just something I can't make a finding about. You needn't worry about that. But as to the evidence of a subjective belief, there is that evidence and you accept that. Yes, thank That's you. That's good. Thank you. And I'm grateful that Your Honour has expressed Your Honour um, in the way that Your Honour has. So I don't need to address paragraph three anymore, but it was important for me to start with that because if Mr Wood or Your Honour indeed had a different view, then that would have repercussions for the ongoing conduct of the case. So it, yes, it would. It would. And I, I should, of course, I mean, I'll, I'll wait to hear what... Um, anything that Mr Wood might want to say in reply, but um, if perhaps I... a way, what can I just say this, without encroaching on your 30 minutes, I, I tried to tease out with Mr Wood and I think we reached common ground that whether it be unfairness or legal unreasonableness, it's a fact intensive inquiry and you can't take the facts and circumstances of any other decision as dictating the result in this. It's, it is fundamentally a matter for me to decide whether in all of the circumstances of this case, and just to bookend it as quickly as I can, in shorthand, 11.30 to 7.42, that's what I'm examining. And uh, I, I would be uh, most reluctant on the available evidence to impugn the conduct of a decision maker for an actual intention to pressure on the basis of the evidence which is here. Now, that may not be sufficient for you. It doesn't kill the point. It just means that that, that ingredient, perhaps the better way to think about it is you. As I said, I think on Thursday, care is needed not to overreach or overstate. Now, whatever the facts of the circumstances were, the particular delegate was darting in and out of the room, which was being video recorded, and a fair inference, and tell me if this is not available, was that he was, in a sense, going out, consulting, getting further guidance, coming back in, dealing with another issue and so forth. And whatever happened between interview uh, number one and interviewer number two, there is evidence about how Mr. Djokovic felt. Yes, I accept That's all of that. Thank you. I accept all of that. Thank you. So if I could then address paragraph four, Your Honour, and Your Honour can read that to yourself. Um, essentially, I'd actually repeat something that Mr. Wood said earlier this morning, that we did not respond to the submission that there is no law requiring a person to be vaccinated to enter Australia or to have an exemption. Your Honour? Yeah, read yes. That. Now, we didn't respond to that because in our submission is not relevant to any of the grounds. None of the grounds alleges that it was not open to the delegate to have been satisfied of Section 1161E in the circumstances of this case. What the grounds are in my submission, particularly with Ground 1C, all the target material, uh, is not illogicality or unreasonableness in the ultimate decision, but illogicality in a step of the reasoning adopted by the delegate in reaching the final decision. That doesn't mean that... Not a step along the way. Indeed. That's very clear, actually, from the from paragraphs 27 to 29 of the terms of the application, which Yuan has given leave for them to file. I just want to make that clear because it makes good my submission that, um, in the end, actually, whether or not there is a law requiring a person to be vaccinated to enter Australia or to have an exemption is beside the point. And to make this additionally clear, I don't say this to say that Ground 1C fails at the threshold or anything like that. Of course, I'm going to have to deal with Ground 1C as it's been put by Mr Wood. But I did want to make that clear because Mr Wood has said it orally and said it in writing. And therefore, I take it the applicant considers that to be important to their case. And we say it's not important given the way that the grounds have been framed. But can I also say this, Your Honour? There is at least one provision that exists on the statute books that permits the executive, the Commonwealth executive, to control who may enter and remain in Australia. And that is, of course, Section 1161EI itself, the very provision exercised here. That provision does not present a high bar. Can I just go to two um, 
cases only in this half hour, Your Honour, because then I can clear this away and not have to deal with it this afternoon at all. Thank you. Really... That would be useful. Just hang on a second. What's the first? The first one is in the supplementary authorities that we provided this morning. I apologise to the court for the lateness of it. And Well, the, you, what you've said uh, <clears throat> means that we'll have to deal with it uh, more efficiently in another way. Tell me the name of the case citation and the paragraph. Perfect. So it's um, Minister and ERY19, medium neutral citation 2021 FCAFC 133. Your Honour, over the adjournment, we'll see that's tab eight of our additional authorities. Have they been delivered in hard copy, do you know? If they haven't, they will be in the next hour, Your Honour. And so that's this very is- hard. That's all I know. It's even more serendipitous. Paragraph again. Uh, the paragraph references will be 81 and 82. It's serendipitous uh, that Your Honour has given me the indulgence of this half hour. I can tell Your Honour succinctly what the propositions are there. Paragraph 81 emphasises that the word risk computes notions of possibility. Paragraph 82 says that the word risk is sufficient to connote possibility in quite the same way as by the use of the word might. And that was Justices Lee and Wheelahan of the federal, full federal court. Yes. The second case, thankfully, is before your honour. This is in part A of the existing authorities. It's Leota and Minister, tab 12, medium neutral citation, 2020 FCA 1120. Yes, paragraph. Paragraph 15. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you very much. And the points that I draw out of that while everyone is turning it up. Which I have. Thank you, Your Honour. The point we draw out of that is Her Honour Justice Banksmith emphasises that um, the statute was amended in about 2014 and lowered the bar even further. So one doesn't even have to be a risk, one might present a risk. Yes, and maybe, again, might be, clearly lowest threshold. Indeed. And again, I repeat, there is no challenge to the actual ultimate decision, just very many and several challenges to the reasoning process, which I'm going to, of course, have to come to. Sorry, so, sorry. Can I, can I just um, step back from that again? Because it yes. may be something that I um, need to clarify in reply. Yes. I, I've already clarified with you that... Um, at the forefront, this case is what we call a step along the way. Yes. Now, now, for others, the the way in which a ground of unfairness or legal unreasonableness might be made out could occur in at the simple level, one which is focused solely upon the process by which the decision is reached, that is the steps along the way leading to the decision. The other way, as you've put it quite correctly, is that the legal unreasonableness could, or the unfairness could flow from the fact of the decision itself. And as you're submitting, and I need to be clear, particularly from the applicant, you, you're submitting, do I understand you correctly, that you say that the applicant is not contending that the decision in and of itself is tainted by legal, sorry, by, tainted by jurisdictional error, which is in the character of unfairness or legal unreasonable. You, you say the decision itself is not being attacked on that ground. Indeed, that is correct, Your Honour. It's only it's only a process based challenge. Oh. So I think I'm sort of half in between, Your Honour. There are very many process based challenges, and before I sign up sign up at two p.m., I'll explain to you how I'm going to deal with those. Yes, there are certainly process based challenges. There are also rationality and unreasonableness challenges. That's why I ask you. Go beyond process, but the point that I'm making is that those are still unreasonableness and illogicality grounds that target, that challenge intermediate steps in the process of reasoning. They don't ultimately challenge, they do not actually allege that it was um, simply not open to be satisfied of 11C1EI. The allegation is more nuanced. The allegation is 
given the reasons that you've given, you couldn't be satisfied because some of those reasons were affected by your logicality or your reasoning. Well, I, I just think you might need to reflect upon that. Uh, and, and if we need to travel a little over to PM, don't worry about it at all. But the point is, uh, depending upon how one um, undertakes the analysis, um, if, if there are, if you will, five elements within a process which leads to a decision and, and you found for one reason or another, forget this case, just any case, mm -hmm. you just found that um, the particular finding of fact or the particular reasoning was utterly irrational or unsupportable or illogical, then, then that would effectively destroy or undermine the ultimate decision. And uh, I just, at first instance, may be assisted by submissions that separate that out in a way. I can understand why a person might want to isolate these challenges and try to answer the individual challenges as a process of analysis. But is that potentially too granular approach in the sphere of unfairness or legal unreasonableness? I don't think I could say more about this stage, but if I feel a reservation, I think in fairness to you, I should yeah. make it clear. I'm grateful, Your Honour. Thank you. Uh, I think this is most usefully explained. I don't propose to take your honour to it now, but I'll provide you on the citation. Yes. Justice Robertson's well-known judgment in SZRKT at paragraphs 150 to 158, where his honour draws a distinction between illogicality or irrationality in the final decision itself, or illogicality yes. or rationality in any of the intermediate findings. And the only reason why I emphasize it here is to, um, and this is going to have more significance in the submissions this afternoon, is to assist your honour, hopefully, to impose um, a structure about how to then analyse and fit in all the various submissions that Mr Wood, on behalf of his client, has made this yes. point. We and might be able to fast track this, uh, not now, but uh, in the ultimate result, because I thought part of, I've obviously got to go back and look at his honour's reasoning, and it's a celebrated case, which has been endorsed so many times that it doesn't matter. But the, yeah. the point I thought when you read the totality of the reasoning, his honour was very careful to um, make some observations about the utility or appropriateness of quarantining the analysis in an overly rigid way. And I, that, that's a very general way of putting it, but I, I mentioned that for what it's worth. I'm, I'm grateful, Your Honour. Um, but so that's the additional thing I wanted to say in response to paragraph four. Can, can yeah. I then foreshadow how it is that I propose to at least commence after the adjournment? And I will be yeah. discussing directly with ground three, because ground for well, collection of ground three A and three B. Very good. Because Your Honour will appreciate that those grounds aren't about um, whether or not it was correct in any lay or legal sense for the delegate to have applied section 1161EI to cancel the visa. Those grounds really do strike at the process by which the delegate applied that provision. And of course, a decision maker has to comply with legal process. Yes. And Your Honour has raised with Mr Wood, and this is my gloss, yes. leaving aside the legal niceties, there are a set of facts here and how should we assess and characterise these facts. The way that I will propose to deal with this after the luncheon adjournment is in this way, Your Honour. I will first explain that Section 124 uh, was complied with in the sense that a response was given and therefore Section 124 did not impose um, a bar on a decision being made. Second, I'll then say that there was no denial of procedural fairness 
for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, in my submission, one does not go to the general common law principles of procedural fairness because the decision to make the interview commence earlier is a matter that's dealt with by the statutory code. So if there has been compliance with, for example, section 124 and all the other provisions around it, then uh, that is a matter that is dealt with by the exhaustive statement of natural justice in that subdivision. And so one does not go to general common law procedural fairness. Yeah, can I replay that so I try and persuade you I've understood it? Um, all, all the structure throughout the Act when it deals with um, exhaustive statements of the natural justice hearing rule uh, provides in, in short compass that the provisions in whatever division or part we are concerned to look at are expressed to be an exhaustive statement of the matters with which it deals or they deal. Yes. And you're, you're saying to me, properly understood in the circumstances of this case, the relevant provisions were engaged so you don't step outside into common law procedural fairness. Correct. That's going to be my primary submission there. And then I'll say something a little bit more about even applying general common law procedural fairness as a secondary. Yes, argument. of course. Yes, yes. But then after that, I'm going to deal with legal unreasonableness. And I wanted to alert your honour that this is how I'm going to approach it, because in dealing first with 124 and then second with the statutory code of procedural fairness, I appreciate that it's, look like, it's going to look like I am hiding behind legal principles when really it's the facts that your honour wants to get to grips with. I wanted to assure your honour that I will get to the facts when I get to legal unreasonableness. But of course, Sir, uh, Mr Tran, again, um, just so that uh, you and I can speak candidly about this, I, I, you understand that it is, and tell me if you have another view, it's uh, an inherent aspect of the nature of a final hearing that because the plaintiff or the applicant goes first, they have the opportunity to put all the colour on the canvas and, and that in a sense becomes a, a platform or an opportunity for the court to interrogate those ideas as fully as it can so as to give, in the first case or instance, an opportunity to counsel for the applicant, an opportunity to say, Your Honour's misunderstood me, what we're really saying is X or Y or Z, so that I can have, at the time of that engagement, some reflection upon whether I've understood the facts or whether the canvas needs to bear some different hue or colour. The second aspect, of course, which is, I think, the important part for you and I now is, while I do that in that part of the applicant's case, a very important related part of it is the collateral objective of giving a respondent forewarning of the sorts of issues that are being ventilated so that in turn you say, well, forewarned is forearmed and Your Honour might have had an indicative view about these things or tried to interrogate those ideas, uh, but we want to say some things about that too. And you say, I should not misunderstand the submissions from the minister as being carefully rehearsed, uh, sophisticated statements confined to legal principles, but you say uh, you want to emphasise matters of fact which justify the dismissal of the proceeding for which the minister contends. Yes, Your Honour. And the only thing I would add, of course, is it's been, um, I say this gratefully to Mr Holdens and Mr Wood and to Your Honour, that given the urgency with which this proceeding has been brought on. Of course, it's also been very useful to hear how they articulate their case this morning, because, of course, the proceedings have only been on foot since about Thursday or Friday. And so that is how I propose to proceed, and then we'll get on to some of the other substantive grounds after that. But I do propose to proceed in that way after the luncheon adjournment, if the court pleases, to focus on um, not the grounds that go to whether or not, for various reasons, Section 1161AI could lawfully be applied to the applicant, but really to focus on what, in my respectful submission, are some of the things that, at least as the applicant puts it this morning, 
do at least raise real questions I'm going to have to persuade Your Honour on about the process which the delegate followed. And so yes. that's what I will um, do after the adjournment if the court pleases in the manner that I have described. Mr um, Tran, have you nearly said everything you want to say at this point? Uh, I have, Your Honour. If I can foreshadow just a couple of cases which I think it might be useful for Your Honour yes. to uh, look at. One uh, is the Taylor decision, which is um, volume 253 of the Commonwealth Law Reports, starting at page 531, which will be, be behind tab 16 of the additional authorities that will be delivered to Your Honour's chambers over the agenda. Yes. I'll be relying on that for what the High Court says about um, whether and when one can read words into a statute. Yes. It's going to be relevant to section 124. I will ask Your Honour to refresh Your Honour's memory because Your Honour Your Honour will be very familiar with them. The case of CRY 16, 2017, FCAFC 210, which will be behind tab six of the authorities that are delivered, and the High Court's decision in plaintiff M174, which is volume 264 of the Commonwealth Law Reports at page 217, which will be behind tab 13 of the authorities. Those are really just for the proposition that there is actually, of course, a close connection between procedural fairness and unreasonableness, such that, and then I can make this concession, Your Honour, such that even if I'm right, and I will persuade Your Honour that I am right and that Ms Wooden is right, that Section 124 was complied with and the statutory code of procedural fairness was complied with, I accept that does not get us off the hook in defending the unreasonableness ground. There is a close connection such that if Your Honour were concerned that the applicant was denied procedural fairness in the exercise of the Commonwealth's right to attempt to apply Section 1161E, well then that is something that would inform Your Honour's assessment of unreasonableness. So those cases help to bear that out and with respect, I think, um, will be things that I actually have to persuade Your Honour against my case. So those authorities may be of assistance to Your Honour and to uh, Mr Holdenson and Mr Wood. Can I identify just a couple of other authorities for Your Honour? One is the McHugh decision, 2021 FCA FC 152, which will be behind tab five of the authorities. Your Honor, that's a very long judgment, but it's a very simple point that I'm going to be getting out of it, which is there's no doctrine of estoppel against, or estoppel restraining the exercise of statutory powers. That's actually the only proposition I get out of it, so it's a very long judgment. And a related judgment. Sorry, just, just what I... Um, try to um, suggest that observation. It's a somewhat sophisticated proposition uh, that this will involve, I would hope from you, uh, some engagement with the idea that I took up with Mr on Thursday last week when I sought to check the direction in which I was sure he wasn't going, but to have him help me understand what he was trying to actually help me understand. And uh, the way in which he put it effectively is um, we're, we're not concerned here with any doctrine of legitimate expectation. And he said that that's absolutely right. That has the nail in that coffin has been rusting there for some decades, but more more precisely, he went on to qualify it by saying, and he's clearly cast and framed the case in this way in part, there's a qualification in the authority to which he referred and about which I'll be reminded, but keys into what you're now saying, that uh, notwithstanding the uh, rejection of any such doctrine, that doesn't foreclose uh, some idea that if a representation was made that could be relied upon. The idea of estoppel is a, it's a wriggly fish, Mr Tran. No, no, it is, Your Honour. And that's why, again, I'm grateful for Your Honour's indulgence in permitting me this 30 minutes. So I can at least put a, mar a few markers in the sand, which I'm... No, helpful. Help. I'm very, very, very grateful. Next. And then uh, I was going to say Lamb's case, 214 CLR1, which will be behind tab 15, but Your Honour is, of course, very familiar with precisely 
um, what I was going to take you on a, to LAM for, substantive and procedural legitimate expectations. But that is going to be one of the cases that I was proposing to go to. And then finally, I think it will be useful for Your Honour to consider two cases. Both of them are going to be um, losses of mine. So I'll be revisiting happy memories. The first one is going to be um, Environment Centre Northern Territory Inc. 2021 FCA 1635. That is potentially a useful case for Your Honour to consider because that was a case where Justice Griffiths found of the federal court that an exercise of statutory power was unreasonable in circumstances where um, the representation had been made about one date and then the exercise of power had been, the power had been exercised on a different date. That, at least as I've described it, might sound a little bit similar to what we're getting at. And what I'll persuade to do, I'll attempt to do this afternoon is explain how that's distinguishable. So that will be in the fold of authorities as well. None, no parties alerted you on the tour, but I thought overnight that's actually somewhat close. And so I, would... well, I said to you last week, inevitably, I, I, it's the kind of case where parties are going to bring to mind some late in the piece additional authorities. But you, you've said enough to indicate to me and through me to your instructors the immediate need for somebody to get this material to me in chambers. Yes. And then the last case I'll alert your honour to is Parata 2021 FCAFC 46. And the reason for that is this. Your Honour will recall this morning some exchanges with Mr Wood um, about the notice of intention to cancel, to consider um, cancellation. And Mr Wood correctly brought to your attention that um, a necessary condition for the exercise of power under 116 is that you have a notice which is valid a notice which complies with the requirements of section 119, if you want to recall that, that's ground 1A in particular. In my respectful submission, what um, the applicant's submissions have not grappled with yet is when it is that uh, a notice of intention to consider cancellation is valid. So I, of course, accept and Ms. Wooden accepts that it's necessary for us to persuade your honour that it's valid. If your honour finds it's invalid, then 119 hasn't been complied with, 116 isn't available. But in our submission, there's going to be two cases that will be very important for your honour's consideration of what, on that very question. Is it actually valid or not? Is the what we describe as a typographical error, which Mr Wood described in um, more um, florid but perhaps accurate terms, perhaps accurate terms, this morning, uh, is something that takes beyond something that complies with 119. So the first one, as I said, is the Parata case, which is the full court. The second one is the Uden case, U-double-D-I-N, which is in the existing authorities, which is tab 22. So I'll take Your Honour to those this afternoon. And Your Honour will appreciate, I will submit that those authorities will show that this notice was valid despite the um, mistake which Mr Wood took Your Honour to. So that's what I'll do this afternoon and I'm grateful to Your Honour for allowing me to identify some of those matters. Yes, Mr um, Tran, just before we adjourn, um, one of the issues that I sought to draw to the party's attention in relation to the cancellation notice in each of Part A, Part B and Part C yeah. is that the delegate seems unambiguously to have confined the ground for his conclusion to paragraph 116E Roman 1 and conversely or by extension not to anything arising under section 1161D or regulation 243 or anything else and there is that final box to be ticked by a delegate which uses the, the broad catch-all if you will of other now having regard to the manner in which the delegates expressed his reasoning uh, I, I would be assisted if you could deal with those parts of that notice at some point. 
If I could do that right now, Your Honour, I can confirm, for Your Honour, that our position is that the, del the only ground that the delegate relied on is indeed Section 116 um, 1E Roman 1. And I would even go further, the delegate um, only relied upon the health aspect of that, because Your Honour will see, and um, Your Honour is now very familiar with the provision, that it says health, safety or public order. Yes, delegate, that's helpful. I've got it. The delegate only right. wanted to rely upon the health limb of that. All right. Mr. Um, Tran, thank you for that outline. And Ms. Wooten, um, I will adjourn until 3.15. Adjourn the court. The Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia stands temporarily adjourned until 3.15 p.m.